um, restoration up on the hill, and I hear this is still in progress. So before uh, Pedro starts, I would like to introduce him just shortly. That's okay with everybody. So Pedro Marquez uh, provides project management and support for restoration work through the Big Hole River and the Clark Fork River watersheds. Pedro has worked in the Anaconda Super Superfine site since 2009 and joined the Big Hole Watershed Committee as a staff in 2016. Pedro has more than 10 years restoration and project experience in the <coughs> private consulting in Montana and he has been instrumental in the recovery of smelter impacted lands <clears throat> in the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area on behalf of the Natural Resource da Damage Program, BHWC and MFWP. Uh, I probably... Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> should, you should have uh, explained that. His experience in Montana also includes stream ecology <clears throat> from steam and habitat assessment to landscape scale, watershed restoration, planning, project management, and oversight. He and his family reside in Missoula, Montana. So welcome, Pedro, and uh, Thanks. we look forward to your presentation. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I think it was... Uh, a, a brief conversation about Facilia Hastata that um, got Robert, you know, his eyes, you know, the plant, the plant restoration and ecologist is among us, you know, you talk about a specific plant, like, oh, Facilia, oh, how's that doing up there? Um, and that kind of set off our conversation, so, um, yeah, pleasure to be up here. Um, how many, you know, it, it, with Superfund, you hear a lot about Butte, and the work going on here, and then you hear about Clark Fork River cleanup, but how many of you were aware of the Uplands and Mount Hagen Uplands work that's been part of Superfund? Yeah, most folks don't even know, you know, we're, I like to kind of fly under the radar in the fact that we're, we're on state ground, you know, it's a game range. Um, so it's, the, the recovery of this area involves, um, well, you can't just drive big heavy equipment up to it, so it really changes um, what you can do. I'm sort of breaking that rule right now in Muddy Gulch. We've finally gotten equipment into the backcountry, um, but that's not the norm. So I'll just kind of run through a little bit of history. I won't dwell on it too much, and then show some of the techniques that, that we've been doing up there and, and how we've been approaching these really damaged areas um, and open it up, I'd, you know, it's more interesting for me the more we can talk uh, and, and answer questions and, and just address any concerns that you guys have first. So to give you a sense of the area, this whole deal here is the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area. Um, Sugarloaf Mountain right here. You can see it from Route 1 and if you're coming up from, um, there's that Mill Creek Highway that cruises through this way and down to Wise River. Um, it's a beautiful stretch of highway. Everything on your left as you're driving up um, is the Mount Hagen game range. And I'm sure you've noticed some white denuded hillsides coming down. Um, this is kind of a delineation of the different watersheds that are involved. Um, California Creek, the Big Hole Committee is doing, this is all placer mine stuff in French and Oregon Creek and NRD started playing a part in California Creek. Um, and the Muddy Gulch, Joiner Gulch are the other drainages and a little bit on Willow Creek. So give you orientation. Um, I'll try to stay out of French Creek because it's kind of not related to Superfund, but it was part of this presentation. Um, you know, the mining history, I'm not going to dwell too much in this, but uh, the placer stuff that they found in French Creek was very significant. I mean, $300 a day back in 1865, that's a lot of money um, coming from gold panning. But to say that that, you know, that was the early strikes, and of course the Butte Hill blows up, um, and that really caused a lot of the impacts that we're dealing with in the uplands. Um, but the stuff that really amazes me, and, and we keep finding remnants of some of these pieces that were involved in the 1860s, the amount of machinery and heavy equipment can't be underestimated. That went all the way into the backcountry. Um, up in Muddy Gulch, where there's little stash piles where they had 
their sleds that they used to use to drag logs out of the uplands. Um, you know, in the 1860s, they were winter logging up there. Um, I guess coming from here, you guys, you know, know, probably know a lot about that history. Further up French Gulch, this is what they call the Chinese Wall. Um, just, you know, that's great habitat for fish, right? <laughs> fish love that. Um, that's just a. And then more, you know, obviously the impacts and the damages that we're talking about, we talk about the, it's, it's pretty much sulfur dioxide coming out of the stack landing on the hills. Um, along with that it was all the infrastructure and the wood that they needed to first to fuel the smelters. Um, in the early days of the smelters it was all wood fired and then it switched to coal. Um, but you still needed a ton of uh, wood for the infrastructure, for all the mining infrastructure. And so when you get up to the Mount Hagen uplands, you notice that it's just tree stumps as far as you can see and the, and the recent you know, regeneration of pine. Um, just to kind of give you, you know, some more of the kind of eye-popping stuff, the, they were able to collect, you know, $6 million worth of copper just from sweeping the hillsides. Um, the, just to give you a sense of the level of the contamination that was in the smoke, just leaving the stack. Um, and with the winds around Anaconda, uh, if you guys have spent time there, it, it blows the wind, it blows the smoke around and that gets deposited on the hillside. Sulfur dioxide was the main culprit, killing a lot of the vegetation. Um, not to mention just a little bit of wood that they needed. Um, in the Mount Hagen game range, it, that was some of the biggest logging operations of its time. Um, Gifford Pinchot, with the early days of the Forest Service, actually came down to oversee the, the cuts. A lot of the timber marking technologies that were developed in the Forest Service were developed in the Mount Hagen game range because of the size and scale of the forestry that happened in that area. Um, so, you know, 300,000 cords. We see remnants of all of this infrastructure up in the hills all the time. Log flumes, networks of, um, they would divert water, you know, catch it in one stream and divert it for miles and miles and miles. And everywhere they could get a log to the flumes by either railing it up or cabling it, they would put it in these networks and float the logs downhill. Um, pretty, pretty amazing stuff that went on. Um, so, then I don't want to dwell too much in history because I'm sure, you know, here you guys get a lot of that and, and hear all about it. It's, it's kind of eye-popping and um, if anyone's really a history buff, I'd, I'd love to include more of a historical analysis of Muddy Gulch and Joiner Gulch into our work and, and into what we're presenting to NRD. Um, I just don't have time or budget for to do that kind of work, but I'd be really curious to, to see if there's anyone in the that you guys know interested in that kind of research. Um, I'm, I'm game for that. These are the kind of the sleds that I was talking about. We find the remnants of these are still up in the hillsides. Pretty fantastic. Um, and this is what we're left with. This is the top of Joiner Gulch. Um, definitely past the ecological tipping point. Um, these are friable mineral soils. It's volcanic welded tuff is one of the parent materials. There's many different parent materials in the uplands. Where we have the volcanic tuff is where we really have most of our problems. Um, the other parent materials just don't decompose the way this does. Um, they stay in rock form, so you have some talus slopes where there's rhyolite. Um, where it's volcanic tuff, the stuff just, you could grab a rock and throw it and it just breaks. It's not really, it doesn't have much to it. Um, and so, you know, there's a tap root, those are your lateral roots, there's where your soil was originally. So that's what we're dealing with. There's no organics left. There's no water holding left. Um, six to 18 inches of forest soil is pretty generous. In some cases, you know, these tree stumps are sitting two feet up off the ground. Um, so we also, with that, you know, your seed sources are few and far between. You have extreme summer, winter, climate, wind erosion. Um, wind erosion is not to be underestimated, actually. Um, the, the amount of the winds howl up there also. So there's just a lot of factors that keep this place from bouncing back the way a lot of other areas in the uplands have bounced back on their own. Um, 
to parent material being a big factor. Seed predation, if you're a mouse up here, you know every single seed source and you're after it. So, you know, the, the bitter brushes and any of the other seeds that the rodents like, they're on top of every single one of them. There's, there's not much left for natural re regeneration on these slopes. Um, and then loss of grade control. So you, those rills start and within 50 feet, you're in a 15 foot deep, 20 foot deep hole in the earth. Um, so these things just become sediment superhighways. It's pretty evident that, um, you know, this chunk of land and this chunk of land were just a gentle swale. And head cuts have happened from the bottom up and year after year of big rain events and the hills just kind of wash down. So you just, it's pretty daunting. This one is all the way up Joiner Gulch right by the, the Big Bear area from the first image I had. Um, and then this is California Creek. Same deal when you start with those bare uplands, the rilling action starts, um, the velocities pick up, and these plumes of sediment just head right down to the creek bottom. And in a lot of cases, the entire, um, I guess, geomorphology of the valley bottoms has been changed by these big sediment dumps that have happened over the years. In the case of California Creek, you know, the stream is pinned up against the hillside here. If you look on in that area of the big hole, the reference condition is valley to valley willows. You know, it's willow bottom beaver habitat as far as you can see. Um, where you have these sediment dumps, the stream gets confined into a tiny little channel and y you lose all kinds of functionality <coughs> with the stream. Um, and the streams tend to downcut into that soft material. And so you lose floodplain connection. When the stream runs really high, it doesn't overtop its banks. You don't get sediment deposition. Um, you just get straight downhill. So all that sediment rushes downhill. Landowners in the big hole you know, used to say, um, you know, during big rain events, sometimes all the way down to the big hole would start running white. And it's basically this volcanic material that's, that's run all the way downstream. I dug a hole 26 inches deep. It's all volcanic ash from the tops of the hills. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't dug all the way down. I, I don't know. At some point, I suspect that you would hit kind of deep, dark earth from old beaver ponds. That would date back to probably the 1850s or so is my guess, but I haven't, I haven't gotten a machine out there to do that. Um, so then in the streams, you have you know, incised conditions, like I described, no hydrologic connectivity. Um, the riparian areas along most of the stream channels are just, they just sit four to six feet above the channel itself and their roots are just, every year, they're just you know, reaching for that water. Um, and the, the trajectory of this is that it's just gonna keep cutting itself down and down. Um, and you'll see a lot of times, you'll just see upland grasses right up on the stream side. Um, and then, you know, with the limited riparian area, the moose that are in that area just kind of mow on everything. So it wouldn't be a problem if there was more diversity. And I'm gonna see if this video goes for me. If it doesn't, I put it in. I have it just in case this happened. I did bring it into here. So let me go right there and see if that guy opens. Oh. Oh, bummer. That's not going to happen. OK. Well, I'm oh, sorry about that. This video, it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. I was going to fly you into the uplands. Um, I'll see if maybe after the presentation, I'll try to get back to that and make it work for you. Um, so now, let's kind of talk about the history of restoration up there. Obviously, the smelter stack stopped in 1980. 
um, natural recovery is then allowed to begin because you, you don't have an inundation of um, toxicity coming in from the air. Um, record of decision in 98. In 2007, the NRD started, um, started assessing the conditions up there. ARCO puts out a remedial action work plan. Um, and then we sort of jumped on board and some of the early work that we did was taking the whole seven by seven square mile area of the uplands and started carving out, you know, what's really an erosion source. The, the key here is that we're focused on the sediment. Um, sediment is what's carrying the metals into the water. So basically ARCO and EPA and everyone is pretty much under, the, under agreement that the more we can just keep the sediment on the hillside and keep it from tr being transported down slope, that's a big part of the solution. Um, we started some demonstration fertilizer trials and some demo projects, um, started doing some BMP installations in 2014, I've picked up additional funding from DEQ and, and have kind of picked up uh, partnerships with the DNRC and DEQ grant programs and, um, and just been sort of working on small scale demonstrations and then scaling them up. So with each successive project, we're just trying to get a little bit bigger with our uh, approach and the scale of what we're trying to do. Um, after we've kind of, you have to sort of prove success at a really small scale before you, you know, ask a client for a larger sum of money to do that project bigger. Um, so gully BMPs, where we can mechanize, we do, but otherwise there's no roads in this upland area, um, or at least no roads that the landowner really wants to access again. Um, so most of what has to be done in here has to be done by hand. It's kind of the good old days of the Civilian Conservation Corps up there. Um, there are willing organizations and, and people that are you know, willing to do this work, and it's pretty fulfilling and gratifying, and um, that's really the only way that we can do it. Um, so in general, you know, we have the bare areas, we're trying to establish vegetation on them. Then you have the gully networks, everywhere we can plug those up and slow the flow of sediment downhill, we do that. As the gullies get bigger, if we can put in some engineered solutions like large rock check dams, we'll do that. Um, and then in the stream, because they're all incised and the water's just moving downhill too fast, what we want to do is try to bring that stream bed back up so that at high water, the water dumps, it spills out over the floodplain and that sediment is captured on the floodplain. Um, so in terms of sort of big picture ecological processes, that's how I view this work. We're trying to get the processes together um, and once, the, once that's kind of underway, then nature is going to heal itself a lot cheaper and a lot faster than anything we could do. Um, Obviously treat weeds. Luckily we, we don't really have a significant weed problem back in the uplands. Um, so fertilization and things like that are, are viable approaches. Um, and we have to do a lot of protecting from the elements up there. Um, if you put, throw seed down on the ground up there, the wind will take it away. So anything you do, you really have to dig it into the dirt or cover it or protect it in some way. Um, so give you an idea, so we operate under this SSR framework, steep slope reclamation. They're designated one, two, or three, or four. SSR one is pretty much revegetation by hand, like seeding, things that you can just kind of toss out. SSR two are uh, BMPs that are installed mostly by hand as well. What are BMPs? Best management practices. So the, the, the techniques that are sort of generally agreed upon by the industry and engineers as, as practices you can do to deal with sediment. Um, and then SSR3 is mechanized steep slope best management practices. So for example, when we arrived at, this is at Cabbage Gulch further down um, in the wildlife management area, the sediment was coming straight down here and cruising through this gully, and you can kind of see the white here, this was the plume. Um, 
we came in and cut that off and started diverting the flow across the contour, which slows it down. And as soon as we cut off that flow, the veg that was on either side of the gully just started filling in. So, I mean, that's a pretty easy approach without having to go in and do too much here. We showed that nature is going to heal itself if you just keep the physical soil from, you got to stop it from moving and just covering your seed bed. You know, year after year, you would just get these big sediment washes. Um, so different than some of the other reclamation going on where you have a significant toxicity or pH issue with the soil, this one, we just, kind of, we just realized that it's, it's really just the physical movement of soil that was keeping the seed bed from germinating. It was just kind of every year just getting washed away. Um, so that's, so here's an example. 2012, we started building in these little contour uh, earth berms, putting a couple little speed bumps in the middle. These are just logs, beetle kill pine trees that we harvested from nearby. Um, here's the same guy in 2014. You know, big wash of sediment comes in, just fills that baby right up. Um, in this case, we did not line this with coir, and we had a couple blowouts. So it blew out here, and then you come out, and there's a big sediment dump. So we just built another berm down below it. Um, and if you go out there now, you know, it's just, it looks amazing in that site. And, but here's, a, here's Cabbage Gulch. Here's July 2014. Um, you can see we've taken our major gullies here, and we created these sort of S-shaped, we kind of treated each one of these like an ephemeral stream. You know, the more you can slow it down and move it across the landscape, the more the sediment's going to settle, the more the seeds are going to find little niches to, to establish, because there is a seed source up here. Um, so everywhere we could, we dug these little earthen berms. So every one of these guys is just like what I showed you. In here, in here, in there. But now, check out what's a good spot to watch. I think like right here, pretty much pick anywhere. This is Google Earth Images. This is July, one August rainstorm, kaboom. That's like an inch and a half of rain in Cabbage Gulch all in one watt. Everything we built filled and spilled over. It's just phenomenal the amount of sediment movement that happens up here. You know, so this guy, whoops, you know, that spilled over. So our approach has been, you know, come back in and build these up again. Come back in right here and build another one right above it and catch that sediment. And it's sort of a if we're lucky with the year and we don't get a torrential down, you know, downpour in August, our stuff holds and the vegetation establishes. And we're just going to kind of keep playing that game until I think eventually we hit this ecological tipping point where the vegetation establishes enough that the velocities and the amount of sediment coming down is reduced and the vegetation establishes from the bottom and controls that flow. And at some point, I think we're going to hit a balance where the natural processes will take over. Um, but it's pretty discouraging when you get out to a site after one rainstorm and everything you did, you know, that year is just, I guess it worked, but it wasn't big enough, right? Um, SSR2, these are hand installed steep slope BMPs. Um, you know, we started experimenting with just some of these ideas. The, a lot of these gullies actually have uh, a pine forest that's regenerating on both sides of the bank. The land managers would prefer aspen and shrubs. And so, you know, when I suggested, can we take out some of these pine trees, she's like, be my guest, go ahead. So we're, we're using the material available to us. We can't really truck up a bunch of material. So we're using what's right there. Um, so, you know, rock where we got it, and it catches, it catches sediment. Um, when you go back to this site right here, grasses are popping up all out of this place here. You know, and then if you build another one right on top, that's kind of the process. It's, you know, mini version of what humans have done since the beginning of time to control erosion, you terrace. Um, another couple examples, you know, we're starting to get more creative and more aggressive with how big these things get. Um, and then at the bottom, where we can, this is a, a rock check dam. So we did punch a road up next to the gully, 
Um, this isn't all rock, it's most, mostly an earthen berm that's created and then that's lined with a plastic liner and then topped with rock to sort of secure it into place. Um, so this is, you know, it's about 100 cubic yard capacity, 80 to 100 yard capacity for each one of these. We've got about five of them in the California Creek drainage. Um, by comparison, you know, with a crew of uh, Montana Conservation folks, Montana Conservation Corps, we plugged three and a half miles of gullies just using logs. Um, you know, so we're, we're trying to do both and there's definitely a, a, a cost difference. For the exact same amount of money, you can get yourself three big rock checks at the bottom of a gully or three and a half miles of checks throughout a gully system. Um, both are great. You know, you gotta, you gotta take both of them when you can. Um, so the idea is that these structures, if they were to fill with sediment, then, then they would kind of cascade down the other side. Um, you'd, all of a sudden, you'd have a widened gully uh, bottom. You'd actually have a floodplain that the stream could then carve a stream into. Um, seeds have a place to settle. You can kind of keep building up on these. Um, Again, the mechanized solution, we just don't have that option to take, you know, all the earth on either side and just started pushing this thing in. Um, the amount of destruction that would be caused to address all of the gully networks in here was just too much. And for the character of the landscape as a game range, um, you know, the landowner pretty much just doesn't want to go that direction. Um, of course, a lot is possible if you want to completely, you know, mechanize your operation, but that's not on the table. So um, by holding back moisture, you know, you can see from this greenery here, when we, before we put these structures in, this was just white all the way to the bottom. It was just a little V with a trickle running down the middle of it. Um, as soon as we stopped up the water and a little bit of the sediment, um, annual plants like monkey flowers start popping up, um, which tell us that there's a seed source and really, it's just that physical sediment deposition that wasn't happening. Um, and here's one of the one of the big ones we built. Um, th there's improvements to be made on this structure, but the idea is th this kind of tests the limits of what a hand crew can do. This is about 22 feet across. We pretty much just ran out of logs that we could actually physically span, which that was about as big as we could get. Um, Hopefully one day that thing fills. We need to put a lot more material in the bottom of it. Um, but already, just the results of putting this coir fabric down, the vegetation on this side of the slope, this was pretty much bare when we started. Um, so, you know, keeping track of all this is a big part of the effort. These are the gully BMPs that we put in. This is about that uh, Montana Conservation Corps effort, about three and a half miles of gullies. Um, that we plugged, kind of cutting off the sediment pathways. Um, we did some work trying to trying to quantify what that looks like. Um, I won't go into the details of all of this, but you know we've got about 1,900 tons of sediment catchment potential at the installed capacity, um, and this was before we put in a bunch more structures. So that number is actually much much larger now. Um, in 2015, we had captured a total of 333 tons of sediment, and that's actually by measuring it and um, putting together a formula based on the area of a prism like that. Um, and then we applied a 0 0.065 tons per cubic foot um, for sandy loam soils, and that just comes from straight engineering kind of manuals. Um, is an attempt, you know, none of this stuff is perfect and we're not going to be exact, but it's just a way of trying to relate what we're doing to, you know, for example, DEQ sediment uh, TMDL data. Um, another thing we've done, so in the bottom, that all kind of deals with up top, in the bottom of the streams we've been uh, installing what folks are calling beaver mimicry structures. You know, a beaver is, creates a leaky dam um, it allows water to pass through, but it also holds back sediment. They do it for their own selfish purposes of creating large wet areas with more willows, more aspen that they then feed on and can create caches and live off of that for the winter. So 
we thought, well, if we can create structures that mimic what beaver dams do, we can do the same thing. We can flood out the floodplain. Um, so for example, you know, there's your top, your bare upper area, the sediment plume comes down. This was just a big white sediment plume from one of the images in a previous slide. Um, we planted it as close to the water's edge as we cared to. And now with these little structures right there in the spring, instead of all the water gushing down the creek, it's actually flooding out. And you know, you start see, we're starting to see evidence of willows and things popping up and the uh, wetland plants, the boundary of the wetland plants are starting to expand as, as these things fill up. And as one fills up, you could plop another one right there, right on top of it, and back the system up even more. Um, these are really easy to do. You can take a crew of volunteers out there and just hammer these out really quickly. We use the pine trees available, just pop them in there and pop uh, leafy material in that just holds back the sediment, creates a lot of surface area to slow down the water. Um, I guess that's an example of the, oh, this is willow stake. So that's another thing that we've done a lot of. Just pop willow stakes in the stream bank and get those reestablished. Here's an example of a beaver mimic structure. There was your original channel. And look at that pile of sediment that we blocked up. Um, so now our stream bed is here. Next year, our stream bed goes up a little bit more, and then all of a sudden, the channel starts looking like the morphology that it should for that area. Um, you know, here again, this is kind of a big beaver dam, a beaver mimic structure, but that's the width of the channel um, coming out of it before we started. But then look at that, you know, you get four times more flooded width here. Um, we've put in over 300 of these structures in one stream. This is just kind of some data on the, the tons and the sediment captured. This is kind of all relating to, to DEQ TMDL documents because we want to, this is one of our metrics to show the effectiveness of uh, this one grant that we got to work on California Creek. Um, there's a lot more anecdotal stuff I think is a lot neater to see. For example, the voles that cruise around the riparian area at California Creek, you know, they create their underground tunnels. And at one point, we started seeing voles digging tunnels that exited into the stream. And what we realized what was happening is we've been backing up the water so much that their tunnels were starting to fill with water. So they were actually like opening up a hole to drain the water from their tunnels back into the creek. Um, you know, I couldn't ever put that as a metric for a grant program that that's what we were going to do, but it's kind of one of those fun anecdotal signs that I think we're, we're on the right track with this technique. Um, and then we come to the upland veg. Um, this is pretty daunting when you get up there. Um, here's the MCC crew. So it started with just a couple fertilization trials where we just, you know, what happens if you just put a nitrogen bomb on the ground? And instantly, you know, a little seed and nitrogen and pop, you know. Um, this, these early experiments really showed us that this is not a toxicity issue. It's not a pH issue. We don't need to be hauling lime up to the top of the hills like we do in a lot of the other damaged areas um, in the Superfund site. Um, and then we put together some experiments digging trenches and adding compost, adding organic fertilization. This was just an inorganic, like agricultural fertilizer, you know, 30% N. We started using some slow release uh, organic fertilizers. Um, you know, here's a trial with a product called Biosol. I don't know, maybe you've heard of that. Um, and some seed just a little 100 by 100 plot. Um, yeah, so kind of keep your eye on the red arrow in this dead tree, kaboom. That's good enough growth for us and good enough evidence for us that this technique, if applied on a larger scale, will work. Um, the, so then we scale it up. You know, you take a look at the tree in the background. So that was, you know, we go from 100 by 100 now we got some money from the DNRC's uh, planning grant program um, to do about three and a half acres, two three and a half acre sites. 
Um, and in this case, the wind is howling, like I said. So we did the same deal. We cut three trenches underneath uh, and then rolled this coir fabric over on top after we had filled each trench with fertilizer and seed, rolled these guys out, um, kaboom. You know, I was up there in June and the sound of pollinators was overwhelming. And you would not hear, you wouldn't hear a single bug up there before this. Um, and what the nitrogen did, all the plants that are trying to exist, you know, there's, there's grasses, there's a couple forbs. Um, they were growing from underground. They're all rhizomatous plants. Um, so all of the reproduction was happening by, you know, sending tillers out and popping another plant out. Um, what the boost of nitrogen did is it allowed the plants to actually flower, um, which they weren't doing. You'd barely, you know, you'd see a flower here and there, but I was up there and it was just buzzing with pollinators and every single forb up there was in full bloom. Um, so, you know, talk about kind of jump-starting positive ecological processes. That's one of those things that was really helpful. Um, and this is the Muddy Gulch project that we're currently on. Um, what you're seeing is kind of a combination of SSR 1, 2, and 3. The yellow is where we believe we need to do some fertilization. The orange is where we need to put in BMPs. And then the black is mechanized. And so now we've actually, with this project, we're kind of taking it up another notch. We've actually punched a road and gotten a 320 mid-size excavator up in here. And we're actually filling in gullies with, um, with heavy equipment. Um, doing the BMPs where the equipment can't get to, we do that stuff by hand, um, and sort of working our way out. We're about right here now, and I need to be out here by the end of next week. <laughs> <laughs> but it's happening, and, and it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, I'm not even going to count on this thing flying. So. Uh, we count a lot on, this is just kind of a summary of all the stuff we've done. We count on the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks helicopter. They loan us their helicopter to haul material. So for Muddy Gulch Project, for example, we hauled about 20,000 pounds of organic fertilizer was dropped for us in several locations at the tops of the hills. So we can start fertilizing the bare hillsides. Um, and now with a little bit of a road, we can get all our coir material um, up into the back country. I don't know how much of the mechanization we'll be able to do. This Muddy Gulch project may be an exception. Um, but yeah, a lot of work up there. And here's an MCC crew just kind of having a blast, getting dirty. Um, a lot of folks involved. And I'll, I think I'll try to cut it off there just to you know, have a conversation with you guys. and. Um, see if there's any questions on, on what else we're up to up there. So, yeah, I think I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, I've watched Joiner Gulch for 34 years. Uh huh. When I first went up there, the bottom of it, down by the highway, it looked like one of these sinks, a trench. Yeah. And you've probably been up there recently. It's beautiful. Once the beavers got in there, yeah. it's just been moving. Yeah. There used to be a road up there. Are you show me where the road is now. Wow. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me, but the landscape does seem to be healing from the bottom up. But what also happens that you didn't mention is and where you're working, it doesn't happen very much. But what happened in Joiner Gulch is once those dams started, the water table. Yeah. Came up, and yeah. And the willows on either side just exploded in the yeah. aspen. Yeah. Move. But it was amazing that some of the early work we did on those ponds, we were trying to figure we didn't have any money to put these standpipes in cork in it to figure out what the, the flow was. Yeah. And we put it in, in the creek and came back the next year and the beavers had built a dam and the thing and just filled in the sediment yeah. behind the pipe. Yeah. And then another year I went up and the pipe was exposed. Yeah, no, that's, and it, it's those types of things that gave us the clues that we're sort of trying to, we're trying to mimic what, how nature is sort of restoring itself. You know, we're, I'm under, it's, uh, at least, 
naive or not, I, I just don't think that we have all the answers. I think that nature's gonna do it. And, and it's amazing, there's the surface, what I've been learning a lot is just how the surface water impacts the groundwater and how when you stop the surface water like a beaver dam, it's really catching that surface water, but it backs everything else up. And so you see aspens popping up halfway up the hillside now that I bet, you know, 30, 40 years ago probably weren't there. But you know, they, one of the early plans, and I can't remember if it was DNRC or what, they were going to build a great big check dam in the mouth of Joint and Gulch. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so they looked at it. What's the point? Yeah. And we had, I had a student, and then I'll shut up. Oh, no, this is great. This is, I, I'd much rather that than, because then I have to I, keep I'm talking. I'm professor, so I know how to <laughs> <laughs> I had a mining student take a model that they use for building check dams in mined areas. Mm -hmm. And she looked at the whole drain, jointer drainage, got the, the precipitation, maximum precipitation and everything, and looked at how much check dam it would take yeah. to keep the sediments from running out of there. Well, and then she went up and made, this was 15 years ago, uh -huh. measured the, the amount of dam that was already there by the beavers. Yep. It's already done. It's already a wash, yeah. Well, so what we're, you know, currently working on, the remedial action work plan that still exists right now has a sediment-lined engineered check dam at the base of every one of the drainages in this area. So that is still ARCO's plan for the state to implement. Now, obviously, the land manager, no one involved, NRD, no one thinks that's a good idea for exactly those reasons. The beaver are already doing it. Why are we going to dig up what's naturally occurring, build in one ourselves? And the kicker is once Superfund is done, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is maintaining those things in perpetuity, right? They have to come in every year and dig those sediments out and haul them to opportunity. So that is not an option that they're very happy about. So the sort of what we're trying to demonstrate now with Muddy Gulch, by getting machinery up top, we're creating natural sediment catchment areas in several locations and what I'm hoping to do is add up all of that catchment and make it an equivalent amount of catchment that what ARCO would have proposed to do at the base of Muddy Gulch and show that Muddy Gulch is, the first one. Muddy Gulch is yeah the yeah yeah it's, it's the the last exit of the uh, of water before you get to the divide up there um, you'll see there's been trucks parked up there for a couple weeks now, but that's what we're trying to show. And, and DEQ and everyone's pretty much on board with this concept of, you know, create the natural storage that will grow over time, it'll actually strengthen over time, and not create a solution that requires a pretty heavy bill for a state agency to then foot for forever. Um, and, and ARCO's listening. I think we, we're actually making headway and their plans are starting to adjust. Their toolkit is expanding to, to match a little bit more of what we're trying to show. The beavers do the maintenance for free. Exactly. The trouble is it's, it's going to be slow and it's never going to get up on those ideals. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a limit to where they'll go, and there's elevations in grade. I think it's, slope is a big determining factor of where beavers will, will actually go. We know there's a spring comes out of Joiner up on the hill. Mm hmm Oh, and we've... Beavers, beavers have impounded it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the idea. If, if you can catch a spring and dam it up and pull it up, that spring all of a sudden then becomes part of the groundwater system and it's no longer gushing out of the side of the hill. Yeah, Joe, you got... Well, <laughs> we hit on a... I'm not sure it's a question, it's a comment again. So, um, uh, it, it would be really interesting because it's uh, all the properties owned by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Yeah. Uh, and I've made this argument uh, to no success is what they need to do is um, uh, close the area to traffic because the beaver are there. Yeah. But they in um, uh, Nick Tucci and I thought that they trapped out the beavers in uh, Cabbage Gulch mm -hmm. and yeah. they don't return. Um, it's, it's cyclical, you know, the beaver thing, it's, it's one of those, we actually had conversations where, you know, there were engineers and folks that were 
listening and seeing the hydrograph, you know, with a beaver coming in and plugging a hole at five o'clock in the morning and saying, Ooh, whoa, hey, I wouldn't be out there at five in the morning fixing a, a hole, right? And they're, they're into it. I mean, we're all kind of on board with the idea. The, the, the tricky part is you can't, it's unpredictable, right? The, the engineered controls are important because you can absolutely more or less guarantee what's going to happen and what you can catch and what you can't. So uh, as part as, uh, as uh, you know, you can't recommend beaver as a tool in the toolkit because you don't know whether they're going to be there or leave. What we're, but what we're trying to do is if we create the habitat conditions by flooding areas out and letting the willow and the aspen regenerate as high up the drainage as we can, then they'll come in. You know, and then they, they become part of the toolkit, but bureaucratically in the super fun, just stuff that we have to deal with, you just we're just not gonna win that battle to, to add beaver, you know, as <laughs> I think it would be a tool, honestly. And, and the real tool is banning you know, it's just for these areas. They just need to say do yeah. no more trapping for a while. But yeah, you know, I think it, 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 that's for the gully bottoms and the low parts mm -hmm. on these trends. But I think you're, you're right. The, the important thing is what you're finding on these hill tops and, and the upper slopes. You got to get the... Like. So I was going to ask you, you um, are, are you just relying on the seed source that's there? Or are you no. seeding? No, we're seeding as well. And yeah. So what's your seed mix? Yeah. Where we do all those upland band-aids, um, we're, we're also throwing in a seed, and it's uh, blue bunch wheatgrass, uh, Idaho fescue, slender wheatgrass, thick spike wheatgrass, the fuzzy tongue penstemon. Several of these are bridger plant material cultivars. Um, and I throw in a yarrow, um, and I throw in an alfalfa, just because it's quick to get going. And, and, you know, it's sterile for the most part. It's not going to proliferate. So it's, it's three or four of the Bridger varieties and then some Forbes. The Forbes really make your seed mix expensive really fast. Yeah. But they're worth it and the, the elk like it. And, you know, we've seen little nibbles on our, on our Forbes that come up. And as far as the game range, you know, that's part of the, the habitat up there. And, and now Facilia Hasatada. That, that we're starting to experiment with. That's up there already, and we're trying to, you know, just do a couple experiments that Robert and I are working on to, you know, just show germination rates up there. Yeah, but that, that, that is the key, yeah. Yeah, Robert. On those upland uh, bands, as you actually described them, um, you know, there is that rough and loose restoration technique. Yep. But it's hard for you to do that because you cannot really bring up the machinery, but would that be an option, you know, to take and kind of make it rough and loose yeah. to make the sediment not that easy to come down and soak in water better? I don't know yeah. if that's something that you it is. You, you, you left too early from the site, but that's what we've done. So it, oh. now that we have machinery in, in this one spot, you know, we realized that there were sort of some, there were some chunks of earth with just some pine trees growing on them that ecologically were not that significant. We've grabbed, you know, whole mountainsides and used that material to fill gullies. And what's left over then is you have a big cut on your hillside. And it's, it's interesting, you sort of have to work with your excavator operators. They're used to dealing with um, subdivisions and parking lots and they want everything flat and smooth and nice and clean, right? But from an erosion standpoint, that's horrible. Um, and it really just creates sheeting. So he was sort of having to work against every instinct he had as an operator, but that's what I asked him to do. And it was roughen and loosen every, everything that's left over. As he's walking his way out of the area, he's loosening up the soil. And then, yeah, and then we're fertilizing the heck out of it and seeding the heck out of it um, and, and putting willow stakes in everywhere that's low. Um, so I, you know, next spring will be really exciting to see the result of it because it, you know, it looks like hell when you bring the machinery in, but it, it's actually starting to come together now that the soil's loose and, and he's grabbing organics, you know, the organic layer, you pull that off first and you stockpile it, 
Then you do your earth move and then you bring the organics back and put that on top. And he's grabbing mats of sod where he can and putting that back in as a top dressing. Um, and I think that that's going to work well for us. Um, yeah, sir. How, how many acres are you trying to treat in your project? So, you know, Muddy Gulch, as far as bare upland acres, there's probably 11 or 12. Um, the, the first Band-Aid experiment we did was three and a half at the top of Joiner. That whole, the, the big bare area in some of my images, that's about 35. And we've got some grant applications into the DNRC's program to treat those. Um, it's still to be decided if we can get machinery up there and if it's worth it. You know, it's, it, you'd, you'd have to kind of get up uh, the Cabbage Gulch Road as far as we can get, but then you're pretty much digging yourself like a Forest Service style road all the way to the top of that divide to get in there. And that, that's a, I don't know, it may not be worth it. At Muddy Gulch, I was able to bring the excavator right up the creek bottom that's dry, um, and we're redoing the creek bottom anyway as part of the solution, so that kind of made sense, and the damage is minimal. Um, but if we, you know, in the absence of machinery, we're just going to try to get vegetation established, and it's going to have to be by hand, and I'm just going to need a much bigger helicopter. <laughs> road that goes from Mill Creek up the ridge between Money Gulch and Joiner Gulch. Yes. To where those cabins are. Yeah. I mean, you could get that close to it. Yeah. Too much up. I've, yeah, we've, we looked at that and, and we decided, we looked at that road and the NRD guy decided it would. I don't think he realized what we were going to do down at the bottom, but he was kind of like, no, I think you'd mess too much stuff up by going up this way. Plus, it's a little scarier. With a big machine, you know, on a ridge top versus coming up the bottom. Um, but yeah, there's we're you know we're looking at those options. And so uh, in Muddy, um, how steep a slope are you getting this equipment on? Well, I mean that was Arco's always their fear. Yeah. Well, it's not steep. It's steep if he's staring at it, but by the time. He moves all the earth around. He's only going up something that he's made very accessible. And, and part of the reason, you know, we, we at first thought that we'd go up the side hill, but he looked at it, the operator looked at it, he said, that's, that's just way too much side hill. I'd have to cut myself a road to get in there. And so the creek bottom really became the, the most viable option. And that way, he had to dig himself a 16-foot wide, you know, channel to get up it. But that also creates your floodplain, and then he'll create his creek in the bottom of that. And so we'll have these steep side walls, and then we'll actually have a floodplain, and then the creek. So it, that became a viable option. But yeah, we're not, we're, not, we're not doing any, you know, we're not getting into crazy business. <laughs> and there's, there's spider hose and you know, machines that will go up on steep slopes, but they're, they're slow and it was really a good call on the contractor that we're working with to bring a mid-size excavator and not a small one. It, it's much more damaging going in, but the amount that he can move and the amount he can plug quickly has been really a, a, a game changer for us. Yeah. yeah one yes, of sir. the slides you talked about doing uh, aerial application of seeds and yeah. fertilizers. Yes. And then the slide where you had the, the nitrogen bomb experiment. Yeah. How's that uh, for, for doing the upper uh, yeah. barren areas? Yeah, it's a great question. We did aerial seed, you know, inorganic agricultural fertilizer, and we did hire a guy at a deer lodge to spread that with seed right next to where we did our hand-applied organic slow-release fertilizer. The, the, the inorganic stuff, um, and we even raked it in, you know, I sent two guys up there to actually just rake it, to just try to get that contact. I think it's too light, and the wind just took it away. I mean, it's just gone. There's almost no evidence that we even seeded it. But if you use the heavier organic, it's kind of like a granulated, and it comes with, because of the, the way they make those organic fertilizers, there's micronutrients in there. And I think that's a big, yeah. There's micronutrients in that, and there's another product called Sustain that we've been using a lot 
as well. I think the micronutrient is a big deal. Um, and it's probably the difference between that ag fertilizer and the organic fertilizer because, you know, some of our soil samples, I talked to a, a, a soil chemist who said, you know, you're really missing boron and manganese in there. You know, no, I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable about that stuff, but I know that you sort of, you need those micronutrients for the N, for the nitrogen to be able to be plant available. And I think that's a big difference. Um, and, you know, my focus is more on get the work done, demonstrate success. I'm very, you know, eager and willing to accept any sort of more academic studies and of the, these types of things. Um, I'm, I'm fully in support of it. I just don't have time to do it. But I think the micronutrients and the weight of the fertilizer itself against the wind is, is a big deal. So the aerial stuff, I, I may not do much of it anymore. Yeah. It's not in the soil, really. Like with most of the other contaminants, it, it does spike. I forget which drainage spikes for what metal at high flows, but basically the, the water, the contamination in the water bodies is only during high flows, um, like runoff events and big rainstorms where, you, where you'll get a spike. And arsenic is one of them. I think arsenic is coming out of Cabbage Gulch. Um, but in the soil samples, we're not hitting any um, contamination levels for any metals in the, in the bare stuff. Um, Arco's done extensive sampling, and there are actually more metals underneath the aspen and the willow than there are in the bare areas because it's related to the, um, your clays and your loams. You know, the metal is going to hold on to your finer particle sizes, I have more places chemically, there's just more spots for metals to bind to. Whereas that sandy stuff at the top, it, it just doesn't hold the metals as much. So that's, that's part of the, the conundrum there is if you really wanted to get at the metals, you'd have to dig up all the revenge, all the stuff that's come back on its own. Yeah? I might have missed this in your presentation, but did you give a value for the average pH of the soils you're dealing with? Um, I didn't give that. That's a good question. It's about, you know, on the low end, it's only 5.2. It's about 5.5 five average in the bare areas up there. So it's, you know, it's, it's okay. It's reasonable. It's not like your 3.8s or 3.2s and 2 point whatever is that you find around in some areas around here. Yeah? Uh, the environmental engineering department looked at beaver dams and cabbage gulch. Okay. Yeah, cabbage. <laughs> looked at the effect on metals and pH as it goes through the ponds. Yeah. interesting, but we looked at the, the stream pH in Joiner Gulch many years ago, and it's a little bit basic in the, in the spring, I believe, and the only thing in it dissolved was arsenic. Okay. And then we looked, we cored some beaver ponds, you know, assuming that there'd be more metals at the bottom, you know, as a septic. Yeah. It's just a, because of the way beaver ponds work, it was, you know, it was higher up here and low and then higher, it was just a you know, you could tell it was just mixing up. Yeah, yeah, and the different layers of, you know. That, you know, that was sediment by uh, mm -hmm. uh, contamination, but they weren't making, weren't making it to, to milk They were staying up in the Mm-hmm. I just took, because of the, you know, gouges that the excavator made at Muddy, I was able to take some soil samples at like six feet depths now. And so I have six feet and three feet, which I think are depths that, as far as I know, not many folks have done. So I'm curious to see. You know, it's mostly the volcanic stuff. I'm curious to see what those turn up. I, I don't know. You know, I don't, I'm not a. I don't know enough about contaminant chemistry and soil movement to know. You know, how far those metals kind of percolated down through the soil column, or where and when they get into groundwater. It's the um, that whole area they've written off groundwater because of high arsenic. So it's. Uh, you know, the thought was always that most of the arsenic has moved down and is now in the water table. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why they also had to write off um, arsenic as a human health um, standard in the local streams because mm -hmm. the streams are fed by groundwater. And 
so without digging out the entire bedrock system, yeah. there's little you can do with the streams. Yeah. So by writing off, you, you mean the, the TI yeah, the deal? TI. Yeah. It's technically impracticable, so they waive the standard. Yeah. And they're working on the copper one, too, now, which, yeah. which they'll probably get for, for similar reasons. Yeah. We found quite a bit of cadmium on the surface in cabbage gulch. Mm -hmm. And we also found it in the deer mice, but not in the vegetation. Oh, interesting. I'm pretty sure the deer mice were getting it from grooming. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, all this—it's—it's it's fascinating stuff. You know, I, I where I, I sort of maybe conveniently, I stick to sediment, and I don't really talk about metals. I, I don't really attribute what I'm doing as a metals remediation solution. You know, I'm dealing with keep the soil on the hill, and keep it in ponds and slow the water so that the landscape deals with the sediment you know so and that's really what the NRD program you know that's where it shines is is above and beyond remediation let's get this landscape to something that the wildlife actually want to hang out in because um, it's a game range and so I'm really focused on what the the landowners ultimate objectives for the landscape are um, and so I leave all the metals and contaminant stuff to NRD and ARCO and EPA, and those guys can duke it out as much as they want. I just, <laughs> I just want to, it keeps it a little bit simpler for me. And I, I hope that by doing the habitat work and having the plants, you know, there, they will start bioaccumulating the metals and, and the landscape will start, over time, will deal with the metals issue. Um, you know, I just kind of hone in on the sediment piece. That's, that's, that's how the remedy for the metals is sort of now defined, and that was the whole. Yeah. They just got finished a long technical and practicability evaluation, but it was looking at, um, it was a long linkage of things, but it starts with um, how much soil is eroding off of, the, of, of uh, barren hills and Mm -hmm. How much metals could you uh, expect to be attached to those soil particles? Yeah. And yeah. so the solution was get as much of it reclaimed as you could. Or yeah. Vegetation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a tricky, I mean, it's an it amazing piece of work that they had done to figure all that out. It was a really amazing, it's way beyond me. I mean, I. I was just blown away by how much sampling and, and analysis that they that Arco has done to try to figure it out. Where are the metals and in, in the system? But the interesting part is, is your program is now saying, okay, if we need to reclaim these areas, get vegetation growing. Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. You guys are actually working to find the solution. Yeah, and there's really had one. there's there's I think there what I see happening is sort of. We're expanding the toolkit, and ARCO's started their whole, S our SSR prescription went from SSR 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Now it's SSR 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, SSR 3A, 3B. You know, there's, every gully's its own animal. There's different techniques for different places. And ARCO's latest documents and preliminary designs, they have an expanded SSR toolkit. And so I think they're, they're started, starting to look at some of the successes we've had and, and kind of not coming down but meeting us where we're at and then we're starting to push the envelope on you know doing more mechanization and I think we're we're starting to approach each other on on the, the techniques and, and how to do this stuff um, it's pretty neat it's taken a while you know it's taken how long have we been sitting in those meetings six years or so to get to this point but it's exciting Thank you so much. yeah Thank you guys for having me.